Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode six of School Zone, podcast by the Oklahoma Public School Resource Center. Today, really excited to have State Representative Monroe Nichols here with us. Thanks for joining us with the show. Glad to be here. So, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to. We're gonna we're gonna get into um, uh, the legislative session today. Um, uh, that just kicked off today, and we're also going to get into um, um, some exciting work that uh, Representative Nichols is doing with schools in, in out-of-school time. Sure. Before we jump into all of that, I always like to uh, ask guests, why don't you give us a little bit of an introduction about yourself? Tell us, you know, where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? Sure. How'd you get, so what's your career path to where you are today? Yeah, you know, uh, career path might be a little non-traditional, but how I got here, I was actually born and raised in Central Texas, grew up in Waco, Texas. We, um, we, when did you immigrate? Yeah, I know, right? They, well, oh man, I was about to make a bad joke about something, but I'm not going to do that because <laughs> yeah, no, it no, will no. definitely go viral. There we go. Um, no, uh, I, I came in 2002 to attend the University of Tulsa. Okay. Um, Played, was a student athlete at TU, uh, majored in political science and economics, uh, graduated, started working in the mayor's office there in Tulsa, and I guess that's kind of the start of the pathway to the state legislature, I guess. Yeah. 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 Cool. So so you went, were you in public school down in Texas? So, no. Well, yes and no. Okay. I did both, actually. I'm, I'm a hybrid, was, I actually. I knew it was an interesting path. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a hybrid, actually, uh, okay. public and private, which I actually took into higher education, because I'm also a graduate of TU, which is... Private, private yeah. University of Oklahoma, which is a public school. So I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place, man. I you like can't, it. You can't pin me you down. You cannot pin you down. That's you right. Pin you down. They, I like it. And then, so how the heck did you end up in the mayor's office? So this is a long story. But I'm gonna get the abbreviated version. Um, way back when there was an old, there was uh, he's not an old guy. There's a guy who was president pro tem of the Oklahoma State Senate. His name was Stratton Taylor, and I met Stratton through somebody. He's a legend. Right? He's a legend. I've never he's met an him, absolute legend. Legend, legend yeah. Um, and I met him through somebody I'd interned for while I was in college. And one day Stratton calls me. He said, hey, there's this lady. Her name's Kathy Taylor. She's not related to me, but she's running for mayor. She's Secretary of Commerce now. She's running for mayor. Uh, and introduced me to her, and her and I hit it off. And there we go. Started working on education and workforce initiatives in the mayor's office back in 2006. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. So then let's jump into your legislature. Before we yeah. start talking about the work there. How did you decide to run for office, and why? You know, um, I ran for the first time, I guess, in twenty in two thousand eight, and lost. It was a while back, and I, I didn't know that. Yeah, in eight years, went by and started to jump back into it because that, at that point, was that Representative Scott? It was. Yeah, okay. it was when he ran for his first time. We had a crowded primary, um, and uh, but I came back eight years later, decided to run again, and really, what drove me to run is, you know. I think we all still remember what the world was like a couple of years ago before we passed new revenue as far as um, our inability to fund teacher raises, invest in education. Um, I have a 10-year-old now who I guess was eight at the time. And so, you know, wanting to, you know, really have an impact on his education was a big part of why I decided to run. Yeah. So it's been... Two uneventful years. Not at all. Yeah. What's what's going on? Someone yeah, was yeah. asking me, like, how long have you been there? I said, yeah. And I think it's my third year, but this is my fifth legislative session because we had two specials. That's like, right. Yeah. That's right. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I know I have an idealized version of what it's like to be a, yeah. you know, a legislator because, you know, I get to rub elbows with you guys every once in a while. Poor um, you. Yeah. Well, I actually, so I like to describe myself as a recreational user of yeah. the legislative <laughs> process. I'm not up there a lot. You know, I have, yeah, I have yeah, fun with it, right? right, you right. Know, and then, you know, before that's I get right. too hooked, I get out of there. Yeah, that's, right? good. that's a good deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's those hardcore users I get a little scared of. Yeah, well, you but, know. but um, uh, so I mean, as you look back on it, like what you thought you were getting into versus what it actually turned out to be, yeah. does anything stand out as like, whoa, I didn't expect this? You know, I think that we had gotten to a place, <clears throat> and I'll say this: like I thought, you know, when I was campaigning and talking about invest in education, teacher pay, I I really kind of you know, those are things I was going to go fight for. So I was actually, you know, all those a very tough couple of years. Um, was pleasantly surprised that we actually got there um, mm -hmm. and, and was able to do that kind of stuff. Uh, so, I mean, there's there's part of it that I'm surprised that some of the progress we made, given the track record of of uh, of those elected officials in state government. So that was a that was I guess on the plus side, uh, and I hope that continues on. But you you never know if it does. I think on the flip side of it, um, I did not expect us to go into two special sessions to get it done. I didn't mm -hmm. expect some of those things. Um, and so that was a, that was a little little tricky, uh, but you know what has been I think the best part of it 
so far um, is that when things do get tight, uh, you get an opportunity to really have your voice heard and represent the people who you said you're going to fight for. And the good thing is this last couple of years, we were able to, to get something positive to happen, which is something new, probably for a decade in Oklahoma, right? So, yeah, I've been, I've been here five years. It definitely was the most, yeah, you know, the most active session here. Yeah. So, um, so, so today was the first day of session. Yep. Everything just kicked off today. Yep. Uh, state of the state. Um, well, we, we'll talk about the state of the state first. Yeah. So the governor this is his first time. Um, he came in. What do you think of the speech? Uh, you know, I was there was a lot of it that I was pretty hopeful about. You know, uh, there's a lot of things that um, that were that you know I would consider very progressive causes that are one a lot of reasons I ran on criminal on the criminal justice reform side. I mean, he had a lot of good things to say there. Mm-hmm. He talked about a teacher, another teacher pay raise. I hope that we are also thinking about what we're going to do on the classroom funding side. Those types of things um, was a little disappointed that you know he. Seemingly kind of backtracked a little bit on Medicaid expansion, but it's been something he's been very interested in. But I think overall, uh, the good thing is, is that he has clearly proven himself as somebody who's willing to listen, um, willing to explore different things, which is different. Um, I don't think he's as entrenched. um, And so hopefully he doesn't tend toward the entrenchment and and keeps that that open door and open mind policy that he has so far. Yeah, I I think I've heard a lot is sort of, you know, he doesn't have a, a partisan or really yeah. political background yeah. at all, right? Yeah. This is his first time in office. Yeah. So it's going to be interesting. Um, what do you think? I mean, I think the last few years, there hasn't been a real close relationship between the legislature and the governor. I yeah, that's not really, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think that there needs to be a stronger one? I mean, what do you what are your thoughts on that? I mean, you, you know, you would like for it to be a stronger one. You would think, you know, I guess that's that was also, to answer your question about a surprise, um, given the fact that, you know, we do have, one party has huge majorities in the House and the Senate and, and has a governor's uh, office. You would have, you'd think that the relationships would have been a lot tighter, and they and they, they really weren't. Um, I think it's the people of Oklahoma are better suited when there's a closer relationship between uh, the legislature and the governor. It helps us when we think about, like, you know, long-term commitments to doing things, whether it be on the funding side or just the pure policy side. Uh, so my, my hope is is that – this is a trend that continues on where even if the even if the governor and the leg and the legislative leadership ends up being on different sides of the political spectrum, uh, that the relationship is still there because we got a lot of problems that we still gotta tackle. And not having, you know, folks who are who we've all been elected to solve the same problems not be on the same page. I don't think it I don't think that does a whole lot for people all across the state if we don't if we don't have that. I tend to agree. So you look at the legislative session. I'm excited because yeah. this this will be my fifth session, um, uh, you know, fifth year here. Um, this is the first time we've actually got some money to play with. Yeah, and that nuts. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit different. Yeah. Um, the flip side is there seems like there's a lot of a lot of miles to feed. Yeah. Right. Um, so you mentioned the, the pay raise. Yeah. And then the goal of getting additional money to the classroom right. as well. We're talking about criminal justice reform, which I think is really important. Yeah. But that's expensive. We talked about health care. Improvements, yep. Medicaid, whatever that's going to be. How the heck do we fund all of that? You know, we were talking, and uh, I know early on there was a belief that we'd have six hundred million dollars in new money. Yep, I think that number's shrunk by about two hundred million dollars, something like that already. Yep, and I think you could have a legitimate argument that education could take up every one of those new dollars, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I so think that's what the state department request is. Yeah, so right? I mean, like you know, so there's. There's 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 needs we have all across the state. That's what happens when you kind of let things go in disrepair for, for so long. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's going to be a real challenge this year because there's the other part about that is that I don't think there's anybody who is serving in the legislature now that was even around before it we started was. having budget holes and budget failure, <laughs> revenue failures and, and everything else. Um, and so it, that's it just, right, isn't it? No, I mean, I don't with term limits. I mean, we got 46 new members of the House right now. We have a new <laughs> governor. We got new. You know, the speaker, I think this is his third or fourth term. So, I mean, he wasn't even, I mean, you know, even the folks yeah. who were in leadership uh, weren't around. Uh, so this is a new thing for all of us. And I've talked to some some folks who have served in the past. And their attitude has always been, I would rather have a slight shortfall than a slight uh, surplus because the expectation of those sur- surplus dollars are all over the place. Because everyone wants to um, which is Which it. is difficult. And so I'm going to be on the Appropriations and Budget Committee this year. So it's going to be a really interesting year to serve on that committee, you know, when, when the world has changed a little bit. Uh, and, you know, my, my goal is to make sure that 
those dollars are spent equitably, um, but that we also make investments that, that can grow the state, right? It's not just about tax and spend. It's about investing and growing. And so the areas that we can invest and grow, education being one of them, you know, all these other areas are important too, but we got we to gotta focus and prioritize. Sure. So if, if uh, here's a question for, our, for the educators that follow us, yep. the teachers, the principals, all the folks working in the schools or that just care about schools in the state, they want their voice to be heard. Yeah. What's the best way for their voice to be heard at the Capitol? You know, I think that um, talking to your 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 um, House member and your senator, I think uh, for a long time that kind of was like, oh, yeah, well, what are they going to really do? I think educators have put themselves like front of class right now mm-hmm. um, as it relates to their ability to advocate for what's most important. Uh, and I think you just got to keep on – keep on drilling that. I mean, now when teachers speak, um, when superintendents speak, everybody in that building listens now. And there's maybe a few that are still there. We got a couple of bills that would make it illegal to protest or whatever and all the really yeah. goofy stuff, but nobody really takes that stuff seriously. And I think it speaks to the power that educators have. I remember looking at some polling data way back when 779 was a thing in 2016. 2779 was the... The penny sales, penny sales tax, tax for education. Right? Yep. Yeah. And amongst the folks, when you ask people who they trust most uh, to receive information from, particularly about education, um, legislator, legislative leaders, governor ranked really low at the bottom, who's at the top was superintendents and teachers. So not only do we listen to them, but so, so do people across the state. And it's kind of a, maybe a silly question, but around format i'll give you a silly answer you want me to send you five thousand emails you want me to call you you want me to show up at your door you You know i think i think all works but you know um we all live in communities across the state um Mm -hmm. and so you know i think it's you know uh request a meeting go see somebody ask somebody to come see what's going on in your school the the, one of the challenges and i've said this over and over again and, and this is even when i am outnumbered from a partisan standpoint is that the quality of the people on the floor uh, of the House, and I would guess on the floor of the Senate, is far better than the product that we produce. Um, that's because we're coming in and, and we're, you know, we're trying to make all these decisions on a lot of issues that we're just simply not educated about. A lot of us don't spend a lot of time in, in classrooms. And if we spend time there, we don't spend time in prisons. And if we spend time there, we're not spending time in rural hospitals. And so we, you know, we're trying to figure out how to make all this stuff come together on a lot of ish areas where we, we aren't experts. Um, so help us become experts uh, because I do think there's a lot of good people serving, um, which is sometimes like hard to figure that out because of what you see in the newspaper yeah. and, and what too often times where we fall short from a policy perspective. No, I, I think... That echoes what I hear a lot when I talk with, you know, the full-time lobbyists up yeah. the, the Capitol is, look, if I can get uh, a teacher or a school leader, you know, someone that's that's connected that can passionately show up and not angrily, you know, not, you're definitely not calling names, but, right. but could show up and can, can explain a situation, that's better than 10 conversations with a lobbyist or even... That's, even, that's even 100% true. Donations. It's 100% true. Yeah, it's 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 pretty amazing the power of, you know, uh, uh, if I'm at a committee hearing, I'll hear a, a representative get up and say, you know, this teacher sent me this email or talked yeah. to me about this yeah. issue. So I think it really does speak to the power of the political process. And I also think that, you know, there is, I think, a general agreement on at the Capitol that, like, we know... No matter what what we may say in newspapers, everybody knows we haven't done what we should have been doing as far as investing in education. And and to be frank, a lot of the people who made those cuts and those decisions actually aren't there anymore. So like mm-hmm. you know, it's a little easier to be open about the failures of the past when you know you're not looking across the the, yeah. the table at somebody. Um, but I think that we all also understand that we owe it to the teachers and the administrators and the counselors and the teachers who have stick around, who have stuck this thing out because they've, they've completely bailed Oklahoma out uh, at a time where they got less than way of resources, bigger class sizes, no pay rate, all the kind of things. And so, yeah. and they deal with my kids. That's too. right. And yeah, exactly. Mine too. <laughs> and so there is like a general appreciation that I think we also have, which reinforces how, how much they are revered when they, when we do have those conversations. Again, there are some, there's some bad eggs out there who, you know, want to restrict people's first amendment rights, I guess. Um, but, uh, for the most part, there is like a deep appreciation at the Capitol for educators. No, I think that's exciting. Um, well, it's going to be, it's, it's going to be an interesting session, especially for it education, is, but I think all the way around. So. Yeah. You know, and, um, I think that, you know, they always say that, you know, 
I guess step one in the twelve step program is admitting you have a problem. I think we've at least got the point where admitting we're having a problem, uh, and it's going to take some steps step to, two to get is there. Admitting there's a uh, no, uh, accepting that there's a higher power that can help. Yeah, yeah, so maybe so. Go, yeah, go. so I mean, you know, and we, yeah, <laughs> we're getting there. Baby steps. There you go. I like it. Um, well, let's switch from the legislative session because, contrary to popular belief, legislators seem to have lives outside the legislature. That's a thing. I, I didn't know that was I allowed. Multiple. I mean, really? Yeah. Oh wow. We we need to hear about all these. Well, probably. <laughs> Some of these are uh, yeah, best left off the podcast. Well, you know, I will say I am a fantastic recreational softball player. Are you? Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Mom told me that's where all former athletes go to die, though. There you go. It's so, the softball well, field. So s- slow pitch. Yeah. Which oh, position? I, go. I play all over the place. I'm a okay. third baseman, shortstop, play in the outfield. You know, I'm all over the place. I, I, I would like to get out there and athlete. do that. I, I like to hear that. I mean, you do. You've got the collegiate thing on me. That was know, a long time so. ago, though. So that really doesn't count anymore. <laughs> that was a long time ago. I just finished skiing, and I I can tell you that athlete and my body do not. They 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 share no. I yeah. hate when people are like, "Oh, Monroe you used to play sports." Like, whoa. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that was a yeah. long time ago. Yes, indeed. Yes, things indeed. don't work like they used to. No, I like to play some softball too. That's good. Yeah, That's there good we sport. go. I like it. All right. So outside of that, you also like to get paid a little more than the legislative That's, session. That's decent. Yeah. yeah. Thing. So so tell us about the Oklahoma Partnership for Expanded Learning. Yeah, OPEL is an organization that we partner here with the service center and uh, or the resource center. And it really is all about figuring out how we support the network of, of out-of-school time providers across the state of Oklahoma. Um, it's, it's really exciting work. Um, it also is work that we're really trying to, to figure out how we have the greatest impact there. Um, there's actually this year, and bringing those two worlds together, a couple of uh, bills that may impact out-of-school providers across the state this year. Uh, that are floating out there. And so, you know, we're going to figure out how we can mobilize the network to advocate, not just on those bills, but really telling the story about out-of-school time across the state, uh, even outside of the legislative session. Um, and then figuring out how we can, you know, really rally around all the other resources that are out there to do all we can to make sure that every kid uh, who's in an out of after-school program or community program over the summer, whatever the case may be, um, is in a high-quality program that's going to help them achieve their educational goals in the long term. So, you know, when I've talked with some folks about Opel before, or when it's when it's come up in conversation, one of the questions I always hear is, "Look, we've got enough problems in our schools. Why are we worried about out of school time?" Yeah. What, what, what do you say to those folks? Well, you know, I think that I would say that there's a possibility you'd have less problems there if you did focus some a little bit on the out of school time uh, work. And I think the the big thing is is that whether you look at what young people are doing outside of school from a public safety standpoint, an academic enrichment standpoint, or even just uh, kind of helping them get a leg up standpoint, or just socialization. I mean, it, it is something that I think is a key component of a well-rounded uh, education, and I think that's how we see ourselves, right? It's not like we're making a decision between, you know, uh, the, the I guess, 7.30 to 2.30 day uh, and out of school time. It's really part of the whole a whole platform of things that we should be offering to kids. And, you know, one of the things that we we're talking about today uh, with one of those bills is all around like healthy living and those kind of things and trying to promote after school meals because we know there's a lot of kids in the state of Oklahoma that get their predominant source of meals is school. Mm-hmm. What happens in, when you have four day school weeks, right? Or what happens for that dinner meal? What happens over the summer? And so we can be a critical, uh, critical ally in helping solve that problem but also as it relates to helping the state achieve its goals and, and having more kids that are not only interested in STEM but able to do those types of things and, and, and feed uh, really what is a strong base in manufacturing and in aerospace and, and in energy. Um, you know, we really, the after-school network is, is just a key asset for the state in, in achieving a whole number of goals no matter how you look at it. Yeah, so... Lots of different ways I want to go here. Let's first start on the bills. So, sure. So tell me, do you, do you have the numbers memorized? I yet? don't have the numbers memorized. Okay. I should have. It. It's you know, it's like we'll put oh, it in yeah. the show notes. Just, that's, just, I try just, to say that every set. Yeah, every, yeah that's every right. Podcast. Just come in. Uh, tell me about all these bills you don't know the numbers yeah, for. No, yeah. No. No. Okay. So, but so so we'll, we will get the bill numbers. Yeah. We we'll put them in our show notes yeah, in case yeah, people yeah. want to look this up. But t- so 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 one bill is focused on like food food insecurity. Yeah. Issues. It's really it's really it's also really putting in some standards for like what do we mean by healthy living in the when we talk about after school, it's modeled after a bill um, in Texas. Uh, we worked with some folks at the uh, 
Salvation Army Boys and Girls Club on that. Okay. Uh, so they have their their alliance is really uh, excited about that bill in particular, uh, which I think is is a neat thing. You know, we we're starting to find where we have obviously a lot of folks around the state have been trying to figure out how to how to bring this this issue up, uh, and so and I think we're gonna have a lot of support for it at the Capitol. The other bill is actually creating um, a revolving fund so that the state, if we ever decide to take the big step and invest in out-of-school time programs from a public standpoint, much like we see the 21st century dollars come from the feds, uh, we have a we have a place for that money to go. Explain what the 21st century dollars are. Yeah, those 21st century dollars uh, come down from the feds, and they come to the State Department of Education. There's a grant program um, that uh, a lot of schools and even some community partners are able to apply for to run out-of-school time programs both after school and over the summer. Yeah, and those are programs. I know some of our members, like in Fort Cobb, there's uh-huh. some stuff. Yep. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. I mean, we did, an inter- we did an interim study um, this fall on after school funding and the difference it could make. I think we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 superintendents that came from all across the state who actually the superintendent themselves came mm-hmm. in to talk about the importance of these programs to the overall academic offerings in, in their districts. And so those superintendents, if you go talk to superintendents, they don't talk about this as like something extra. They talk about it as like this is critical to our community, like I said, not just from an academic standpoint, um, but just from the standpoint of helping support families who parents are working until five or whatever the case may be. So the question is, do you you pay to put a kid in a program that you probably can't afford, or do you not take those extra hours mm-hmm. at work, which you also may not be able to afford? So this is these things are, are, are critical supports that we have across the state that are making a big difference for kids. Yeah, and I think so. Not only you know, like like there's like sort of Maslow's hierarchy, right? Yeah. Like, how do we make sure that kids have the right supervision? That's how right. do we make sure that they get food? <laughs> The, the other thing I think is that's not just important but exciting about the expanded learning work is, you know, when we go to school, there's certain structures and processes, right? right? And, I, and right. I, here at the Research Center, we're always pushing, like, how can we make instruction more applicable and dynamic? But you know what? Like, there are some days at school, just like some days at work, it's going to be, you know, we got to get through these skills, right? we got to get through this stuff. The, the, what I like about out-of-school time is... When done right, it can be a lot of applied learning. Absolutely, right? um, absolutely. So, like project-based learning, yep. and and like the different, and, and and as I look at the work of Opel, I think about you know, I mean, a lot of the stuff that goes on at career tech centers, right. and, and and like you know, folks coming right out with jobs. Yep. Are there any programs or any things that stand out in terms of like sort of workforce development? And- yeah, you know, we actually had a uh, just this last last week. Cause today's Monday. Last week, I met with. Uh, Tulsa Tech, and I had their directors and assistant directors from every campus they have in Tulsa County. A little different in Tulsa County. We have one uh, career tech district in Oklahoma City. I think it's split up by by several. Um, and we had a very focused conversation about what they offer in the out-of-school time and the difference it's making. So Youth Build was a program years ago that taught kids construction trades uh, in the out-of-school time space, right? Cool. Uh, and so that was something that was taken in. The grant run, uh, ran out. But it's something that they've continued to do. And so these are kids who, you know, some of them are coming from different spots on the success spectrum as it relates to grades and that kind of stuff. But a lot of them are walking out of that program and going straight to work. Mm-hmm. And they're going straight to work with great companies that are building not only just buildings, but building like roads and bridges and those kind of things. So these are kids who are actually like rebuilding our state uh, that, that found that pathway through this program that was outside of the traditional school setting. Uh, but that was somewhere they got a credential and they have a career that's going to be there, you know, for as long as, as long as they want to do it, which I think is incredibly neat. That's exciting. Yeah. And I think as as Opel moves forward, I think that's the, the Research Center sits on – I get to sit yeah. on the, yeah. the, the advisory board, though I missed your meeting last week. Um, but <laughs> but uh, uh, as, as we look forward, like I, I'm excited to see how we can – we I constantly hear from the business side, we've yeah. got to do more in education, right? And to me, this is a place where we can say, great, now let's get together. You know, let's, let's, uh, let's I spent some time uh, a few weeks ago looking at the state chambers. I think it's the 2030 goal. I can't think of what they call their agenda – and it talks about the uh, uh, okay twenty thirty okay twenty thirty, and if you look in there, some of those things that they have in there is like goals they want to achieve. Uh, there is not a a network or set of programs that are better uh, suited to help the state meet those those goals over the next uh, twelve years, or whatever the case may be, than out of school time partners. Um, that's did a, you did you a, hear that state chamber? Yeah. Jennifer Leopard 
That's Connor right. Robinson. That's right. There's this is, and, and I mean, and I really believe that. And there's a lot of other states that that bear that out. You know about some of the work going on in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And I think if you if you take what they're doing and you think about how we're already somewhat suited to do some of the work with Career Tech, with some of these other programs that are out there. Um, we could leapfrog what anybody else is doing uh, mm-hmm. and do it in a way that is, is, is you know, really in line to not only state goals, but some metrics that we can measure, see how we're doing and that kind of stuff. So, I, I mean, I really think the out-of-school time space is, is where we can we can meet some of those 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 broad goals that we have that uh, sometimes I know we we shoot after them knowing they're like, uh, we'll, no, we'll sure, see how sure. it goes. No, I think, I think you're right. I mean, that's – that it's <clears> – <throat> You know, and, and I don't like the choice of oh, should we focus on in school or out of school, yeah. right? Like, you know, I want to focus on how do we get kids moving. That's in the That's exactly right, right. You know, right. I've always said, you know, I I do a lot of work with Strive Together nationally, and you know, we talk about all the time. And I think it's applicable here. I think it's applicable even in, as we think about policy at the state. The goal has to be how do we take the individual kid or whatever, and we wrap all the things we have around them. Like, how do we how do we make sure all those institutions are serving the kid? And I, and I don't mean in the term how we use, typically use wraparound services, although I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's just we have these broad institutions, whether it be common ed or higher ed or career tech or whether it be all the other number of services we have out there. We just got to figure out how to make all those things work for, for kids because there's plenty of work to go around. So it's, it's actually not that hard. We just got to be a little more efficient. And, yeah, and I think focused on the issue. That's absolutely Sometimes right. Getting out of our yeah. out of our silos and actually yeah. thinking about what's you know what's the best. Which thing also here. speaks to the the need to have those good relationships. Elected officials got to work together. You can't have you know uh, a state superintendent who cares about this, a governor that cares about this, and you know house leadership thinks about this, and then senate leadership thinks. I mean, it you know who gets lost in that is the folks across the state who are counting on us to get it right. Amen, amen. Well, folks want to learn more about open. They find you. Um, o- www.opelok.org. That's o p e l o k dot org. Yep. Cool. Are you on the Twitter or the Facebook? Those we, are the things the kids are doing. Yeah, nowadays, we we I are think. we are on the Twitter and the Facebook, and we're Opel OK everywhere. That's great. That's fantastic. What am I forgetting to ask you? So you know, I so there's a couple of things I think that are that are coming up uh, right now that I think are important, and I'm going to put a plug in for one of my bills that I have out there. I like it, um, and of course. I think the bill number is 2018, but that might be because I'm thinking that because it was just 2018. Okay. So I'm not sure. Well, I'm going to do a fact check on that. But it's a bill that uh, uh, Representative Eccles and I are co authoring in the House. Looking for Wait it. a minute. He's a Republican. You're a Democrat. Yeah. Hey, man. How does um, that work? You know what? It work, It works quite well. Okay. Uh, I like it. It, wor- it works quite well. And, you know, I think that for the most part, <laughs> there are, you know, 80% of the things that we all can come together on there's there's 20 that we're like we're like Ugh. yep no there's That's sometimes not work. you gotta get in your foxhole but yeah yeah and, and i mean and this is one that i think is really neat and innovative and i think we'll at one t- at some point probably start a national trend but it's a bill and it's taken oklahoma's promise which is an incredibly successful program i think i don't know if there i can't remember the numbers on the number of kids who have been through oklahoma's promise so it's the program that if you uh, make have household income of under fifty five thousand uh, dollars you qualify for college tuition okay. uh, here in oklahoma and so we have a bill now that would raise the cap the fifty five thousand dollar cap uh for households where one of the parents is a teacher Okay, uh, and so we've created a pathway. If we can get this across the finish line, by where you know, if you commit to coming and teaching in Oklahoma, uh, we'll commit to making sure your kid goes to college tuition free. Um, and and so right now, That's if you're a exciting. single parent teacher, you're already qualified. But a lot of households where both parents are a teacher, right? Uh, so you you know you're over the the income cap. There's a lot of families like mine when I was growing up, although I was raised by a single mother, but where you you know you you're just above that, but you know mm-hmm. you still. You're still struggling. Still struggling. Uh, so this bill would, would take care of that. And so we can, as we're trying to go back and get teachers back from Oklahoma, or trying to recruit people to go into the profession, um, here's another pretty innovative incentive uh, to get to get people to do just that. So I'm I'm really happy to co-author that with um, with, with uh, Representative Eccles. We are working on some Senate authorship right now, but I'm really excited about that one. And we think that's House Bill 2018. But I think so. We'll I'll check. I shouldn't. Way. I shouldn't have quoted because people look up House Bill 2018. It's probably no, something it's like okay. terrible and horrible. And they're like, "Oh my God, it, <laughs> don't ever have that guy on." <laughs> well, well, I, I don't know why I like to say it, but we'll put it in the show notes. I don't know, even know if we actually put them in the show. notes. I don't notes, even know what show notes, notes are. So, like, if you go to the actual show on the podcast, I watch it every. I've seen all. I've there. seen all five of them. Yeah, have you? 
No, I'm bad. Well, don't worry. You got plenty of time. You got the commute now back and forth between That's Oklahoma true. City and Tulsa. That's true. And I do spend a lot of time. You can hear my melodic, my, my, my melodic baritone voice here on the you podcast. You know what? What a dream that would be. It really. I, you know, what I, t- a dream. I tend to I like to listen to myself talk. I so. I, I, I believe that's true. <laughs> we try and keep it real here on the There podcast. you go. No lies here. <laughs> this is this is this is not the fake news zone here. This is <laughs> all true all. stuff. None at all. None at all. All right, before we get into all that, we, before we get into some trouble, maybe we should uh, call it. Well, actually, is there anything else? Anything else I'm forgetting to ask you? You know, um I think that going back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, and I always like to end with this, I think that the future of the state um, is kind of less in the hands of those of us at the Capitol. It's more in the hands of everybody else. If if people hold us accountable, if people continue to stay engaged and involved, knowing that we have a you know a, a lot of challenges to um, to address, then things will get better. Mm-hmm. Um, if folks, if we fall back and to get complacent and those kind of things, um, it's always politically easy to not do the hard work. Um, so I think that. My my hope is is that um, you know the governor is going to stay committed committed to doing the hard work uh, that my colleagues in the house will stay doing the hard, the, the the Senate leadership and and the Senate Democrats are going to be committed to it uh, but that's only going to continue to be there if people continue to to be engaged um, so you know I think the challenge is is that you know a lot of times they you know we'll leave to the people under the dome. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, as we know from history, not because people are bad people, but because as I said before, you don't know what you don't know. If folks don't continue to be engaged and I, I fear we may fall back to where we, to where we were. So that's my challenge. Everybody. I think that's a, I think that's a good way to, 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 to end the podcast right there. I will note next week, our school board elections, um, school bond elections next Tuesday, oh. the, the 12th. Um, so for for local communities across the state, sometimes Sorry, those are some got, of the most important elections out there. I think we will have in Tulsa. I think we'll have three new board members. Ooh. Well, wait, we we have one up for election. That's an incumbent. One's an open seat. That's a race, and one's an appointment. So we could have uh, three new three board new. members. Wow, wow! And this stuff is th- th- these are critical. Um, Seats that don't get the the the, the attention. Absolutely, that, it's the know, most the it's the most important things you think about it. You know, I think that as we think about, you know, we put all the folks' and attention on like people running for president, the U.S. Senate, and all the way down. But the further and further you go down, the more impact those people have on your life from a day to day standpoint. Exactly. So, Who do you think has more impact, the president or someone that makes decisions that impact your kid at school? That's right. You know? I mean, you know, yeah, uh, if a mayor decides not to pick up your trash, things get pretty bad pretty quick. In you know, and, and you know, if you, so I mean, I, I hope that folks, I hope that the folks across the state, whoever has races, set turnout records for school board because. If we come in this year, say we do some amazing things in education funding, if you don't have that leadership at the district level, it actually probably doesn't matter that much. Indeed. Indeed. Well, thank you for coming in. Um, Again, this is the Oklahoma Public School Resource Center's School Zone. We hope you can find us um, and subscribe there uh, uh, at at your uh, favorite podcast channel. And uh, uh, we look forward to to another exciting episode next week. It's not going to be this exciting. Definitely. All right. Thanks, man. Yep.